Aboriginal people believe that it's our river. It belongs to the Aboriginal people. The traditional owners of this water and we share it with all the community. A lot of the systems in place these days, the different governments, the different agencies, the different jurisdictions and all the different responsibilities, it's all Aboriginal people don't think like that and it's hard for them to comprehend who they need to speak to. There hasn't really been opportunities for traditional knowledge to walk alongside it because you know, we know, we know how to look after country. Hello, my name's Nillian Mosley and I am a Dungadi woman from the mid-north coast of Kempsey. This resource package was designed to help communities to make the most of these opportunities and to exercise their rights within the water sharing framework. I would like to wish you all the best in utilising this resource package, our water, our country. Creator by Army was doing his deeds and making different play things around this part of the world. Then he came across a mob of people at Brewarana who were hungry and hardly had any water. So by Army created and drew a plan of the fish traps for them. He then taught them how to call the rain and after the rain subsided there were thousands of fish coming up through the fish traps. So that is how my army gave us our water. He made it for us. Our dream time means a lot to us. His footprint's still in the rocks down there. It's something that belongs to us forever, in our dreaming and in our future. It's our life, and will always be our life. You look at our holidays when the old people used to say, look after the water, uh, that's the treasure of the earth that was given to us in, in our uh, uh, myth and legend. The springs are protected through law because that's their, their drinking hole. But if it's contaminated, there goes the drinking hole. So there's strong laws and customs for those drinking holes to protect them. I just want to speak briefly about the days before carp, the days before the weir, and um, days before uh, large pumps that are now on the river. We grew up and that river was our playground. We got food from there, such as fish and crayfish. We swam in the river, we washed in the river, and when the pumps break down, we bathed in that river. It's a day out for our people. They'd um, take the kids up fishing and, and swimming and surviving off the waters. They'd camp up the rivers, all the families, and they'd go there and uh, it was beautiful water to drink, fresh, um, but now it's not the same, it's not flowing the way it should be. The fact that we had a resource there that we used and mum showed us how to catch mussels and, and dad showed us, taught us how to swim, how to feel for mussels in the mud and throw them up in the van and then cook them. So those sorts of things we were actually taught by it. Prior to whites coming to Australia, um, Water in Australia was part of that landscape, was a part of Aboriginal communities and, and their culture. There was a very strong affiliation between the way Aborigines lived and water. It was a part of their day-to-day -day life. It dictated how they lived and where they lived. When whites came to Australia, things were changed dramatically, and particularly after the Declaration of Federation in 1901, where water was made a responsibility of the states, we saw a radical shift in the way water was managed. The priority for water management to be development, development of our agriculture. And for the first 90 years of the 20th century, that was a priority for water management, was to get water out onto farms, was to provide opportunities for the farming community, to grow crops, to generate wealth, and to generate jobs and industry. That changed significantly in the early 1990s where all of Eastern Australia went through a very severe drought. In some cases it was the worst drought in history. We saw the Darling River at that time have a 1,000 kilometre long toxic blue-green algal slick where you couldn't touch the water, the cattle couldn't drink in the water, kids couldn't swim in the water. We saw a lot of our coastal rivers for the first time in, in living memory dry up. The Maclay River near Kempsey stopped flowing, which had never happened before. We saw salt start to appear in the Riverina, which hadn't been seen before because 
our groundwater was getting contaminated. Saw red gums on the Murray River dying off because there was not enough water to sustain them. And at that time, our governments, the states and Commonwealth got together and said, we've got to radically change the way we manage water. It's not an infinite resource. We need to do things in a more sustainable way. We need to look at getting some balance, some sharing between industry and between the environment. There was a real institutional shock, I think, that it got so bad and we were supposed to be, you know, the managers, the experts, and things had just crashed. So the water reforms were about providing water initially for the environment and then some sharing between the consumptive users, the irrigators, the towns and the industry and mining and so on. And at the same time, there was a willingness from government to encourage Aboriginal involvement in water planning, to look at including Aboriginal values in water planning, to look at this concept of cultural flows, to look at opportunities for Aboriginal communities for commercial use of water.